Over here, we have a small model of the Gutenberg press. Uh, and uh, the, the amazing thing about it uh, was their movable type. Uh, so they would have all these little letters uh, here, and they would arrange them in a form of a page, uh, and then uh, put it underneath here, the plate, and then you could ink it, put some paper under it, and then you clamp down on it, and then release it and pull the page out. Then you can re-ink it, reuse it. Then you can uh, reuse the letters here uh, again. So you have someone making another page, putting all the letters together. Uh, and while someone's printing it, then you can just uh, switch around and reuse the letters. The other key invention was the paper, like we have today, uh, that was probably stolen from China, how to make paper. Uh, so it was easier, cheaper, faster uh, than using uh, goat skin, uh, a parchment. Uh, uh, so this revolutionized printing. And one of the key things that was uh, printed on it was the Gutenberg Bible. And I had to go through a number of printings. So you have the black printing, then you have the red printing, uh, and then you had... Uh, Somebody had to come in and do all the fancy uh, writing as well. It took a number of years to print the whole uh, Gutenberg Bible. Very expensive uh, Bible. Then we have some other uh, ancient uh, or old Bibles here. Uh, the, we have the, uh, this is a replica of the Shram, uh, uh, Fromshire Bible. Here we have uh, what's called the Thumb Bible. Very small, 1896 uh, Thumb Bible. And then, uh, I guess I have to go back over here. We have the Finger Bible. Then, uh, This is called the Teaspoon Bible, and it was made for one of the World's Fair uh, there. And then uh, one the smallest one here is you need a microscope uh, to read it, the Nano Bible. Now here uh, we have the largest medieval manuscript, Codex Gigas, which means a uh, giant Bible or a giant book, and it's called the Devil's Bible. The story goes uh, that a monk broke one of his vows, and uh, in order to get back into the monastery, they said he had to write out the whole Bible in one night. Well, the monk knew he couldn't do that, so he sold his soul to the devil, and the devil wrote out the Bible for him. And uh, to prove that, you just look in the very back where it has a picture of the devil. One of the only uh, uh, pictures in there of a person. So they call it the devil's Bible, but scholars today don't think that's what happened. They think it took him over 20 years to write out the whole Bible. But it makes a great story. Then we want to go over here to music. Uh, here we have a 10-string harp. Uh, uh, David played a 10-string harp. Then we have a lyre down here. Uh, some flutes. Uh, uh, some old uh, Christian hymns. And here we have a... Um, page of a songbook from the Middle Ages. Notice how big it is because books were very expensive and you couldn't give everyone in the choir a book so you had one big songbook for the whole choir. Then we have Isaac Watts uh, who uh, was the father of English hymns. John Newton uh, he wrote the uh, Amazing Grace, and then Charles Wesley writing many uh, songs and hymns. 
Then we want to come to the Great Awakening. Uh, and this is about the 1740s. Uh, and we have uh, George Whitfield coming and preaching. We have John Wesley uh, coming and preaching and starting the Methodist Church. And then today the, uh, the Pentecostals came out of the Methodist Church. Then we have in England, we have John Bunyan uh, thrown in jail and he writes Pilgrim's Progress. And we have other uh, famous ones. We have Wilberforce. Uh, and then we have Brainerd uh, reaching the Indians. Uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, preaching. Uh, one of the most famous is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. One of his famous uh, preaching. Over here, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, the Geneva Bible. It was more popular than the King James for a while. Uh, the Pilgrims liked the notes uh, along the sides here. And King James didn't like the notes, so uh, the King James doesn't have uh, uh, notes along the side like that. And then uh, the sad one is the, the Negro Bible uh, uh, for the slaves. A uh, missionary uh, group printed it uh, to reach, I guess, the slaves. But they cut out all the parts that talked about slavery and gaining your freedom, uh, like the Exodus was cut out of it. Uh, so they cut a lot of parts of the Bible so the slaves wouldn't get any idea of becoming free. Uh, sad situation there. And then we have other uh, famous writings. Uh, we got uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, uh, we got um, Billy Graham. Uh, In His Steps uh, by Charles Sheldon. Uh, Billy Sunday. Uh, the Fundamentals. Uh, you have uh, John Darby and Dispensationalism. Uh, we have uh, uh, um, this one here is Scopes, the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, Albert Schweitzer's Quest for the Historical Jesus, and then later we have uh, Karl Barth starting Neo-Orthodoxy. Then we want to move to, uh, in here, uh, the Matama map, the oldest map of the Holy Land again here. Here we have at Tel El Haman, I took uh, my kids to go there and help uh, dig there. And some of uh, the pottery that uh, came from Tel El Haman here. Uh, and it gives an idea of uh, how they would dig and how the process goes there at Tel El Haman. It's just above the Dead Sea in Jordan. They are now, uh, they stopped digging there. Uh, last year was their final uh, season. Then other pottery, uh, Shiloh, uh, ABR is uh, digging there at Shiloh uh, uh, each summer, a uh, big group there, uh, where um, the tabernacle was before uh, Solomon's uh, temple was built. So very important uh, uh, dig there. Then we have other uh, cylinder seals from different uh, nations here. Uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, tablets, some jewelry. And over here, uh, the Roman period would be the time of Jesus. And they can tell by just uh, looking at the pottery, uh, it changes over time so they can date pottery by the different styles and changes in time. Then we have a map of uh, uh, Jerusalem, the, the temple, and the city. And then uh, the crucifixion outside the city, uh, somewhere there. And then we have uh, more of uh, the seven churches of Revelation in, uh, in Turkey. And then uh, over on this side, we have some old paintings and photographs uh, from the seven churches of Revelation uh, before they uh, did a lot of excavations there. And here's an idea of what they looked like. 
Then, uh, if we look way down there, we can see the Ark of the Covenant. In case you were wondering where it was, it's right uh, here. Uh, of course, that's a smaller uh, model. And then uh, underneath me here, uh, uh, he went down there and touched the Ark, and that's what uh, happened to him. Then our final stop, we want to turn to uh, uh, Egypt, uh, the Book of the Dead. Uh, is what you would have. They would put it in the tomb uh, so you know how to navigate through the underworld in the afterlife. One of the key things is you're brought to judgment before Osiris and uh, there's a scale so you have the feather of truth which was an ostrich feather and then the person's heart was weighed against the feather of truth. If your heart was lighter than or equal to the feather of truth you could go up into the heavens if not, the crocodile-headed god here would eat you, and that would be the end of you. So if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you can make it up into the heavens. Then there was four different canopic jars to put the different body parts of the person in. Like you put your liver in one, lungs in another. But the brain, they didn't think you needed the brain, so they took that out through your nose. Then we have... Uh, uh, a replica of King Tut's uh, throne chair, uh, very beautiful. And then there was the footstool, and uh, it has seven enemies, I mean nine enemies of the, of the uh, Pharaoh, or uh, nine enemies of Egypt. And so he'd be sitting on his throne, and his feet would be on his enemies. And Psalm 110.1 says, put thou my enemies under my feet. And uh, uh, God calls the earth his footstool, that he's in control. And that finishes up our uh, tour of uh, church history with a little bit of uh, Egypt mixed in.